Her high school attendance was an historical event. One of the Little Rock Nine shares how faith in God gave her strength during a time of tension in our country. Plus, all my chances is up. This time I'm gonna spend the rest of my life in prison. A career criminal faces 80 years in prison and has a change of heart when a cellmate invites him to a Bible study. And I went back to my cell that day and I placed my hands in a Bible and I said, Lord, uh, please. All this and more on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. What does Donald Trump believe about God, Jesus Christ, and the Bible? Well, it's a question that's asked but never fully answered until now. Take a look. Throughout the 2016 presidential election and during his first year in office, Donald Trump's faith has been the subject of much debate. Is the president a true believer, a seeker, or a political opportunist at heart? Despite all the conjecture, no journalist has seriously investigated President Trump's faith background until now. In a new book, The Faith of Donald J. Trump, A Spiritual Biography, CBN News Chief Political Correspondent David Brody and co-author Scott Lamb reconstruct a picture of Trump's spiritual journey from childhood to present. Relying on extensive interviews with the president himself and those closest to him, the authors reveal a side never before fully explored. Well, David, thanks for being with us. And, uh, you know, I've got to ask the question, is Donald Trump a Christian? Well, l l I w I'm going to answer that question, but let me start with this. We make a very clear, uh, call it a disclaimer, whatever you want, at the beginning of the book. We said we were not going to actually come to a final conclusion on that because that's God's job. You know, this is not the Lamb's Book of Life. That's a separate book. Uh, this is also not the sainthood of Donald Trump. It's the faith of Donald Trump. So what we try to do is really explore it. Look, I, we did ask him uh, about his faith in an Oval Office interview that we did with him uh, uh, in August, late August of 2017. He says, I am a believer. He doesn't say it so articulately uh, in terms of an evangelical speak, but he does talk about being a believer. Uh, Paula White, who is close to him, has said, and this is also in the book, says, I've had in-depth, that's the word she used, in-depth conversations with him, talking to him about Jesus plus nothing, good works and all of that, and that it doesn't get you into heaven. And she says 100%, that's the quote, 100% he is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and then Mike Pence, who we did two interviews for this book with, he also says Donald Trump is a committed believer. He is a believer and you can basically take that to the bank. Okay. Well, what about the, the naysayers? Yeah, sure. That would point to a long list of indiscretions mm -hmm. uh, to be, I guess, charitable, mm -hmm. uh, which we ought to be. Uh, but what, what about all that? Well, the way I like to term it, Gordon, he's on a spiritual voyage, and I guess aren't we all? Um, look, I, I think sometimes people get caught up in the Twitter feed and the New York personality of Donald Trump. You know, there's a lot of that. Look, the guy has been a hard scrabble you know, guy for 40 to 50 years. He's a fighter, he's a brawler, he's a New Yorker. And so when you see the Twitter feed, that's that part of it. This book explains the behind the scenes stories, the, uh, in, in essence, some of that more compassionate side that you'll see, uh, his interaction with uh, all of these evangelical pastors that are around him now, look, I mean, he grew up as a mainline Presbyterian guy. And as we know, that Presbyterian church has really kind of slid into that more of that liberalism, uh, definitely not the inerrant word of God as much, so, so much. And so here along comes the full gospel Pentecostal crowd, if you will, talking to him about Jesus plus nothing. And in the book, he actually says to me, I've been impacted like, by these people like I've never had been impacted before. And so clearly, we're, we're starting to see some of that spiritual voyage, especially in the last couple of years. And there's fruit, not just policy-wise, but look at the National Prayer Breakfast. I mean, it's a good example. Yeah. That first, in 2017, when he did that first National Prayer Breakfast uh, speech, it was about ratings of the, on The Apprentice and about the Johnson Amendment. This time around 2018, much different. Less about himself, more about God. There's subtle differences. Okay. Uh, is anyone telling them to stay off of Twitter? <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, 100% they're telling him to stay off of Twitter. He's not listening. And he's not listening. He's not listening. But you know what? Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's an issue. And it's actually been probably, if you would say, what's the number one concern evangelicals have about this president? Please calm down on Twitter. Uh, but, you know, I will say this. He is... Um, He's a piece of work, uh, yeah. but he's all, aren't we all also a, a kind of a piece of work? Yeah, everyone's a piece of work, and everyone is trying <laughs> to learn how to love your enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it might be good for him to love them a little bit more and less on Twitter. Sure. All right, let's get to the book. And, and one of the things that uh, sort of 
surprised me is the influence of Norman Vincent Peale on him. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I remember being on the golf course. We saw a little bit of that in the piece uh, with Donald Trump. And he said at that point, that's when he told me that Norman Vincent Peale is the best speaker he has ever heard, ever, bar none. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, he was able to articulate a message. And then here's the word he used, captivate an audience. And boy, do we see a bit of that greatest showman in mm -hmm. Donald Trump as well. Now, obviously, Norman Vincent Peale, relatively controversial to combine Christianity and psychology, uh, psychology and kind of wrap it all into one. But, you know, Donald Trump is, gravitates towards a positive vibe and, and Norman Vincent Peale was definitely giving that off and you know because Donald Trump is a hard worker and it comes from his Lutheran roots on the German side with his father and so I think you put hard work and a positive can-do attitude and that's something he enjoyed. Okay was he one of his stars? Uh, was who was, was, was uh, uh, Donald Trump one of Nor Norman Vincent Peale's stars? Yeah yeah I mean I think it was uh, I, I would say that Norman Vincent Peale enjoyed uh, listening and, and being in the company of Donald Trump. Now, there's some folks in his family that weren't big fans, if, the, if that's what you're... Yeah, that's talking. what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, oh, yeah. That, that was the surprise yeah. to me, that they actually knew each other. Oh, yeah, they did. They did. And as a matter of fact, that's something that um, he... It's one thing to sit in a, a church pew and listen to a pastor, mm -hmm. but it's another to say, well, we're not just acquainted, but... Uh, we're well acquainted. Well, well acquainted. His father, obviously, good friends with Norman Vincent Peale too. You know, it's funny because uh, the the Trumps really kind of rolled in that in that area of not just with Norman Vincent Peale, but with like Billy Graham, for example. There's, a, there's stories in the book about and Donald Trump telling me this that he remembers his father watching Billy Graham on television and all of that. And and, and Donald Trump himself talks about watching Christian television, CBN, and and just a lot of the Christian television programs. One of his favorite groups is the Gaithers of all people. Donald Trump liking the Gaithers. Who would have thunk it? So there's a lot of things in this book. I, I was on a CNN's show, one of the CNN shows, New Day, with Chris Cuomo. And I said, Chris, look at it this way. This, this book tells the other part of the story. So, for example, if you have a 30-second soundbite, Russia and everything you hear on the Twitter feed and all that, that's about 15 seconds of the soundbite. Here's the other 15 seconds. gives you a more complete picture. Okay. How has his faith influenced what he's dealing with Israel? Uh, it, it's been paramount to it, Gordon. It really has. I mean... It, we always hear the word spiritual fruit. Well, here's some public policy fruit. I mean, he has been a steadfast supporter of Israel for a very long time. Uh, and what we have seen, obviously, with the embassy moving to Jerusalem, and, you know, he knew he was going to take hits on it, but, you know, Trump, I mean, he doesn't care about taking hits. And it's kind of nice to see a boldness uh, from whether it be a president or anybody for that matter. And, uh, and also, you mentioned Israel, but how about what he did around Christmas time when he's talked about Jesus so much. It went viral, actually, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, and, and that came out. So it's just nice to see a president actually uh, speaking those words in public. And a lot of people say, oh, he's just doing it to get the evangelicals. He's pandering. Donald Trump doesn't know. If Donald Trump could pander, he wouldn't know how to pander to evangelicals. <laughs> he would have no clue. Can I just tell you a quick story about that? Sure. No, it's, it's in the book. It's at the beginning. It was uh, April 2011, the first interview I ever did with Donald Trump for CBN. Um, and I asked him, I said, so how's, what's going on with church attendance and everything? He goes, well, you know, I go on Christmas, I go on Easter, I go on a couple of Sundays. And I'm thinking to myself, probably not the best answer for the Christian Broadcasting Network. But that's the point about Trump. He's just going to give it to you straight. And there's something uh, endearing about that. Well, it definitely tells it like it is. Yeah. One of the things I really admire is he's finally unmasked uh, the real situation in the Palestinian Authority. Mm -hmm. And he's going after the funding to terrorism, uh, the pretense of being part of peace negotiations. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully that will actually s trigger something that people will say, well, we can't get away with a lie anymore. We've, we've got to come to terms. You know, I would say this. He mentioned that at this TV network anchor luncheon that's before the State of the Union address about a month ago. He invites two people in from all of the networks, and CBN was there as well. Myself, Jenna Browder, were there in the state dining room. He talked about Palestine, or the Palestinian uh, Authority and the fund, and he looked at everybody around the table. Why in the world are we giving, people, why are we giving them this money? You know, what are we getting for? You know, it's always transactional with Trump. Uh, and so, so he's been pretty outspoken about that. Yeah, well, that's good. All right, if you want more, the spiritual biography, uh, Faith of Donald J. Trump, uh, it's available nationwide. And David, thanks for the book. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Gord. Thanks, thanks for, for being here. All right, still ahead, the teenager who wound up in the history books just by trying to go to school. Civil rights hero Melba Patillo Beal joins us live right after this. The ugliness of racism touched Melba Patilio Beale's life even before she was born. 
Her grandmother was forced to beg a supervisor to let her mother give birth at the hospital. Well, he agreed, but there were conditions. They couldn't tell anyone. They had to stay in the storage closet until delivery, and the birth certificate wouldn't say where she was born. Well, despite the hostilities, Melba survived. Her grandmother said, God has a special assignment for you. And 15 years later, those words came true. In 1957, Melba Patillo Beals was one of nine African-American students chosen to integrate Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. As one of the Little Rock Nine, she endured shouting, angry, rock-throwing mobs, and threats from the KKK. Only Melba's faith in God sustained her during her darkest days and helped her become a civil rights warrior. In 1999, she was awarded the nation's highest honor, the Congressional Gold Medal, for her role in the integration of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. In her latest book, I Will Not Fear, Melba shares her journey through oppression and persecution and points to faith as the solution for the world today. Well, welcome to our show, Melba Patilio Beals. It's wonderful to Thank have you. Thank you. Take us back, if you will, to 1957. You and eight other students were handpicked to integrate a Little Rock school for the first time, a high school. You're 15 years old. What was that day, the day you went to school in a new school? The, the problem with my situation was I just thought it was the first day in a new school. Yeah. I didn't know it was the first day in a new war. And it was the first day of a declaration of war by the segregationists on we children. But and no, they came ropes in hand to do business, as they said. But you never even got into school that day. And yet you went back. Where did that fortitude and that that chutzpah come from? Living my, you know, I write about this in a book called March Forward Girl. If you live in Little Rock, Arkansas, and at five you watch a, a, one of your own men hanged on the rafters of the church. And the first thing I noticed at age three was my parents would be one way at home, but then we'd go to the store. They'd be intelligent, educated, sweet, proud people. We'd go to the grocery store where there were white people there. You know, we had to stand in line forever. Yeah. My parents wouldn't say anything. White ladies would come and get right in front of us, right? And we'd be waiting with our groceries and things. And they would kowtow, yes, sir, no, sir. Uh, don't look them in the face. And they couldn't reach for, my mother would reach for a can of baking powder. And she couldn't do that. The clerk would come over and get it because the thing was, if any black person touched anything, then they'd say, well, that whole section's not saleable, right? So I'd grown up like that. So that being the case, when you say to me, going to Central High School offers me the opportunity to get out of Little Rock? Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. That had been the dream I had lived for. When I was three, I said to mother, where did I come from? I think it was a little bit old four. She said, the stork delivered you. <laughs> I put my red wagon in front. And I sat in the wagon. You know why I know why? Because I thought if the stork came once, he might come he's going to come back to deliver <laughs> the other people. I'm going to flag a ride out of here. <laughs> so wanting to get out of Little Rock was so deeply instilled in me because there was what you call the Little Rock fear. But after going through what you went through, not just that first day of school, but through the whole process, months later, you had a chance to meet Dr. Martin Luther King. And... He spoke something into your angst and your frustration and your fear that touched your life forever. What did he say? This task had become so huge that I couldn't hold it inside. Yeah. And so when I met him, it was so moving because he was so different. And I thought, this must be who God is like. <laughs> so I'll tell him everything. Just spew out. Spill it. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, they put acid in my eye. It was, they hit me. They stuck me in my back with a, uh, a flag stick and on and on I went. And he let me finish. Very slowly, he looked at me and he said, Melba, don't be selfish. Mm. You're not doing this for yourself, but for generations yet unborn. I would learn to just hate that sentence in the beginning. But as time passed on, it was the sentence that sustained me. You have to stay here. You can't back out. You can't get kicked out. You can't start hitting people back and misbehaving because you are influencing and having some influence on the lives of those who will come after you. But you did several things, Melba. You, you endured, for one thing. You thrived academically in that setting. And then when it was all said and done, you forgave. How important was that? Grandma said, look, if you want to hold animosity, 
in your heart. Yeah. Go for it. But it's like chewing on lemons. I'll give you three lemons here. Start chewing, girl. And sometimes she'd hand me a lemon if I said something, she'd say, chew. <laughs> because if you want to continually chew on lemons, the worst, not, not the great ones, but the worst lemon ever, mm -hmm. then that's, that's what it means to hold that in your heart. Whereas the person you're holding animosity toward may not know you exist, may not know what you did, may not care. And so she would say, you cannot love the Lord at the same time that you have animosity in your heart. Well, can I ask you, your, your book is called I Will Not Fear, and you take us through the incredible um, experience of what you went through in integration in the 50s. But today we're still struggling with race issues. What, what message do you want people to take away from this when they read your book? The most important message is, is that God is here. No matter who your God is, we have different gods. I acknowledge that. God is here and now. And the ways in which he satisfies and rescues you are not always how you expect them to come. So we expect there to be a choir overhead <laughs> and angels, and it's going to be exactly and precisely like I want it. I'm here to reassure you you're wrong. It's not. But it's going to come in his time and in his form. Yeah. And it's up to you to express the gratitude and move on. And it's going to make a difference. And you have made a difference with the life that you've Trying lived. To. You Trying are. To. You are. And the books that you've written. I Will Not Fear is the book she's talking about today. We have just skimmed the tip of the iceberg. You need to get a hold of this. It's, subtitle is My Story of a Lifetime of Building Faith Under Fire. And it's available wherever books are sold. We all need to read this. Melba, thank you so much for being here. It's been us. my blessing, my pleasure. Wonderful thank you. you Getting to meet you after all these times. <laughs> yeah, we'll wave at each other from now we'll on. We'll wave. Okay. Well, up next, a man facing 80 years in prison with no possibility of parole. I became a monster. I was thinking of any way that I could take my life in prison because I didn't want to live in this cell for the rest of my life. And he didn't have to. See how two miracles set him free after this. Roy Yamamoto doesn't take freedom lightly. He once faced 80 years in prison with no possibility of parole. Desperate and suicidal, Roy cried out to God, and two miracles followed that set him free. All my chances is up. This time I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. I was going through a lot of depression. I was thinking of any way that I could take my life in prison because I didn't want to live in this, this cell for the rest of my life. Roy Yamamoto was facing 80 years in prison without the possibility of parole for a series of drug-related crimes. You know, drugs really controlled my whole life, that I became a person, you know, I became a monster, and I didn't care about anybody or even myself. When he was a boy living in Hawaii, Roy struggled with a hidden shame of a learning disability. Didn't have the ability uh, to do my schoolwork. Uh, I was put in a special ed, and I was so shame about that. I was shame because I couldn't keep up with the rest of the students. So you know, I hanged around with the, the wrong crowd, and we started to drink and smoke weed. He managed to graduate high school and played a year of college football in California, where he was introduced to cocaine. It took over my life. The addiction was so strong when I got back. Uh, instead of working out and training for the next season, I started to hang around with the partying friends again. And uh, we did the cocaine and the drugs. And what happened was when it was my time to go back and play football, all of a sudden uh, this career in drugs was more important. Roy stayed in Hawaii, got a job, and started a family. But his drug use escalated after a coworker introduced him to crystal meth. This guy passed me a pipe, and I took that pipe, and I took my first hit, and it got so addicted, it, I started to do it every single day after that. His constant drug use drove his wife to leave with his young daughter. I did more and more drugs just to cover up the hurt that I was going through, and eventually my habit became almost $1,000 a day some days. To pay for his habit, Roy became a strong arm collector for the drug syndicate. He was arrested in Ohio for extortion, kidnapping, and robbery, and sent back to Hawaii where he eventually faced more drug-related charges. 
The lawyer uh, came and spoke to me and said that, Roy, the state is putting you away as a career criminal. They're giving you 40 years, but they're gonna stack another 40 on top there because of your record. You know, I got back to the cell and I was in these four inner walls and I was thinking to myself, man, I'll spend the rest of my life in here. And I remember going to my cell and I said, you know, I don't know God, but I cannot live in here for the rest of my life. I need your help. While in prison awaiting trial, Roy's cellmate gave him a Bible and invited him to a Bible study. And I remember walking to that Bible study and I was uh, carrying this big Bible and all my friends that ran around on the streets with me, they were looking at me and laughing, hey Roy, where are you going with that Bible? I said, you know what, I don't know. You guys cannot help me out of this one. My family, my lawyer, my friends, nobody can help me out of this one. So I'm gonna just see what God can do for me. At the end of the Bible study, Roy prayed and asked God to forgive his sins. I prayed uh, the sinner's prayer and when I said, amen, there are these uncontrollable tears coming down my eyes at that point and it wasn't tears of shame anymore, it was tears of joy. When I said amen to the Lord, God made me to be a new person and he shared with me that my life never didn't end, it just started. He wanted to understand the Bible and grow in his new faith, but Roy had never learned to read. Honestly, I couldn't uh, pronounce the words in the Bible. And I said to the leader, oh my gosh, I don't know if this is for me. How will I learn about God if I cannot even read and learn about Him? And the leader said, you know what, you go and pray. Nothing is impossible with God. And I went back to my cell that day and I placed my hands in a Bible and I said, Lord, uh, please, my prayers that, that you teach me to read so I can learn about you now that I accept you into my life. And literally no time God did this first miracle that I know was from God. He taught me, he taught me to read and was through reading the Word of God. He says God also freed him from his drug addiction. God brought so much joy. He changed my whole thinking and my whole life and took away this addiction. And uh, I could never do it. It was only because Jesus in my life. So instead of a 12-step program, it took a one step to Jesus taking his hand. As his trial date grew closer, Roy began to pray for a miracle, another chance at freedom. I prayed, God, please, you gave me a million chances. I don't deserve it anymore, but give me one more chance to go out and share how you changed my life and to share the Lord with my family so we can be family for all eternity, just not just here on earth. Your word says that nothing is impossible with you in Ephesians. If that's so, that you do this miracle for me. At his trial, the witness for the prosecution didn't show up and Roy was eventually set free. He found a church and began serving right away. But after two years, his case was brought to trial again. Back in court, his church overwhelmed the new judge with stories of Roy's changed life. The judge was moved. And he said, I just sentenced your, your co-defendant to 20 years in prison, 10 years mandatory, the same place where you're standing today. But he looked up to me and said, you know what, I know that God changed your life. So instead of sentencing you today, I'll cut you free and give you back your freedom. Roy has used his freedom to help others start a new life with Christ. He leads several ministries and camps reaching out to inmates and their families with the love of God. Being a pastor over uh, a church today and being able to uh, give back and run our camp agapis for the children of incarcerated and it's like, the, the biggest blessing in my whole life. The two judges who cut me free from doing a life actually help us uh, with the camp, camp agapes and we've been doing it like for 12 years now. The message of hope that set him free from guilt and shame is the same message Roy shares with inmates and their families today. I'm grateful to the Lord even for the things I went through. I want everybody to know that no matter what we went through, when you receive Jesus into your life, He'll come into your life and He'll forgive you for everything in the past. And He'll make you to a new person and, and make you not shame, but have joy. And you can have that same thing. You can have not shame, but joy. How do you get it? You ask for it. That's what Roy did. Here he is. Uh, you can't get too much closer to a bottom than he got. And he's facing jail time. He's facing all kinds of consequences for the actions that he's done. 
but God set him free. And he's able to set you free too. Not in an external way, but internally. So you can have the peace that passes all understanding in any circumstance. Now, how do you get it? Ask. That's all you have to do. It's a very simple prayer. Jesus, if you're there, if you came for me, if you love me, if you're my savior, could you show me? And do more than just show me. Could you change me from my innermost being to the things that I crave to do, I no longer want to do, but I want to serve you. And I want to help people. I want to be known as a person who gives and who loves. And if you pray that with all of your heart, the Bible says that he will hear and he will answer. If you want help for that, with that prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. All you have to say is, I want to know Jesus. I want to know if he's real. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to condemn you. We're here to tell you that God loves you. And he is able to forgive any sin. Uh, I believe in confession. It gets things off your chest. It gets things out. And they don't have hold on you anymore. Sin wants to condemn you. It wants you to live in darkness. It wants you to hide. But when you step out into the light of his presence and say, here I am, here's what I've done. Could you forgive? Could you set me free? He'll do that. Make that call. Do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word. But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. God bless you. We'll see you again.